Well, good morning. Where, whatever the time is. Uh, I don't know where you are or what time is you're watching, uh, but uh, welcome to our journey through the Word of God. We're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 6 to 13 today, and Paul's continuing his, his teaching to the church in Corinth about the poor example that the children of Israel set during the Exodus and why there were now different rules, standards, different ways of doing things that were different than the rules and standards that the children of Israel had. So let's start off in verse 6. Now these things become our examples, the things that we just previously talked about, to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted, and do not become idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play, nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 fell, nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents, nor complain as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. We can and should learn from Israel's failure in the wilderness, is what the Apostle Paul is saying. So how did Israel fail? They failed in that they could not say no to their desires. So we must not lust after the evil things as they also lusted. The Corinthian Christians who insisted on eating meat that was sacrificed to idols, even though they led other Christians into sin, they just couldn't find in in themselves to say no. They couldn't do it. They said, look, the meats are so good and it's so cheap and it's such a good bargain. They just couldn't say no. Why? Why should they have said no? They should have said no out of love for God and love for their brother and sister because it was causing them to stumble. That's why they should have said no. And that's the lesson for you and for me. You can't just say yes just because, well, but it's such a good deal and it tastes good. He says, don't become idolaters, as were some of them. Israel failed to keep their focus on God. They started giving themselves to idolatry, worshipping other things, Exodus chapter 32, Numbers chapter 25. And some of the Corinthian Christians not only got too close uh, in their association with idols, they also made an idol out of their own knowledge, their own rights, their own principles. You cannot make an idol out of your rights or what you think is right or what you think is a principle. That cannot become an idol. You can't worship that above God. Nor let us commit sexual immorality, as some of them did. Israel, in their idolatry, surrendered to the temptation of sexual immorality. And he said they rose up to play. And he's, that's a quote from Exodus chapter 32, verse 6. And and it's a tasteful way, really, to refer to incredibly gross immorality among the people of Israel. Now, we know that the Corinthian Christians were having a lot of problems with sexual immorality because 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 6 tells us about that. And the context here suggests that it's connected with their selfish desire to just basically please themselves, expressed in insisting on the right to meet meat that was sacrificed to idols. So, um, let let me read here uh, a quote from Cole. The verb translated play in the word rose up to play suggests sex play in Hebrew, and therefore we are probably to understand drunken orgies. That's in Cole's commentary uh, on Exodus. So, some pretty gross stuff that the Apostle Paul was referring to there. And he reminds them, hey, listen, when they did that, you know what happened to them? In one day, 23,000 of them died. Uh, Now, the number that's quoted here actually presents us with a little bit of difficulty because the quotation from Exodus chapter 32, verse 6, sets the context, and in verse 28 of Exodus 32, it tells us that there were about 3,000 men of the people that fell that day. So perhaps there were more that died, which the scriptures didn't record, or there were 20,000 women who died in the aftermath of the golden calf incident. Uh, Some think Paul's jumped ahead to another time uh, when Israel's sexual immorality during the Exodus brought God's judgment upon them, which is in Numbers chapter 25, verse 9. 
Uh, and in that numbers passage, we're told that 24,000 people died from the judgment of God. Uh, but perhaps it was 23,000 who died in one day. We just have to acknowledge these things when we see them. Say, okay, well, this is what could have happened. Then Paul says, nor let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents, nor complain. Numbers chapter 24, uh, sorry, chapter 21, I should say, describes the incident that the Apostle Paul is talking about here. Uh, in response to the complaining of the people, God sent fiery serpents among them. And again, their complaining hearts showed them to be self-focused. They were more concerned with their own desires than with God's glory. And the same issues caused trouble with the Corinthian Christians uh, who would not yield and give up their right to eat meat sacrificed to idols just for the sake of saving somebody else. And because of the warning of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 to 5, it seems that the Corinthian Christians believed that they were safe from the danger of being destroyed uh, as the Israelites were destroyed because of past spiritual experiences or their own accomplishments. But Paul's warning is, is something here that is very solid. If it happened to Israel, it can happen to you. So be on guard. Guzik says this, the Corinthian Christians seem to have regarded this issue of eating meat sacrificed to idols and therefore thereby stumbling their brother as some kind of small issue. Paul wants them and us to know that it reflects a selfish, self-focused heart, which is the kind of heart God destroyed among the Israelites in the wilderness. It may have been a relatively small symptom, but it was a symptom of a great and dangerous disease. Okay, let's move on to verse 11. Now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. Since we are those upon whom the ends of the ages have come, we can and should take warning from the bad examples of the children of Israel. We have a greater responsibility because we can learn from their mistakes. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. For the Corinthian Christians to resist the temptation to be selfish and self-focused, they had to first understand that they were actually vulnerable, that they actually could mess up. And the one who thinks that he stands, in other words, that he can't mess up, is not going to stay on guard against temptation. So he's actually more easily able to fall. Guzik says this, temptation works like rocks in a harbour. When the tide is low, everybody sees the danger and avoids it. But Satan's strategy is temptation, in temptation is to raise the tide and to cover over the dangers of temptation. Then he likes to crash you upon the covered rocks. I love that visual. I think that's great. And he says, listen, no temptation has overtaken you except is such as common to man. We often want to excuse our particular tempting circumstances. I was, oh, they were very unique. It only happened to me. And they were, it was a one-off special exception. But God reminds us that any temptation that we go through, it's not unique. Lots of other men and women of God have faced the exact same or similar temptation and have found the strength in God to overcome that temptation. Um, this, is a, no, I've got a, this is a great gold Guzik quote, okay? You can be victorious in the strength of Jesus, not in your own strength. We fight temptation with Jesus' power, just like the, like the girl who explained what she did when Satan came with temptation at the door of her heart. She says, I send Jesus to answer the door. And when Satan sees Jesus, he says, oops, sorry, I must have the wrong house. I love that. I love that. See, God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. God has promised to supervise all temptation that comes at us through the world and through the flesh and through the devil. And he promises to limit it according to our ability and capability to endure it, according to our ability to rely on him. 
not on our capability to rely on ourselves. That's when we will fall. Satan would destroy us in a minute if God would allow him. Uh, he, won, he, he tried to destroy Job in Job chapter 1. He tried to destroy Peter in Luke chapter 22. But God would not let him. See, God keeps us from things that we can't handle. But what we can handle and what we can't handle, I think, changes over the scope of our lives. And it should change as we mature as Christ followers. With the temptation, we'll also make the way of escape. God has promised to not only limit our temptation, but also to provide a way of escape in tempting times. God provides the way of escape. He'll never force us to use the way of escape, but he will make the way of escape available. It's up to us to take God's way of escape or not. Always. The way of, the sca of escape isn't the same as just relief from the pressure of temptation, which some people find by actually giving in to the temptation. Uh, that's the wrong way to relieve temptation. And we end up facing the same temptation over and over and over again until we show Satan and our flesh that we are actually able to bear it. Uh, Barclay says the word for a way of escape is really a, a mountain pass with the idea of an army being surrounded by the enemy and then suddenly seeing an escape route to safety like a mountain pass, the way of escape. It's not necessarily an easy way. The way of escape doesn't lead us to a place where we escape all temptation. Uh, the only place that will ever happen is when we get to heaven. The way of escape leads us to a place where we might be able to bear it. We're reminded that to be tempted is not sin. To entertain temptation or surrender to temptation is sin. When we bear temptation, Satan condemns us for being tempted. That's the trick that he uses. And that is condemnation from Satan. And the Christian does not need to accept that. Uh, I'm, I'm going to leave it there for today. Uh, I think there's a lot in this. There's a lot of heavy-duty chewing, I think, as we go through this, of, of application to our own lives and thinking about the temptations that we endure and, and how, how our, our own circumstances correlate to the church in Corinth. In some ways, you can see that we really haven't come a long way in 2,000 years. We're still having the same problems the church in Corinth had. We're still thinking the same way. Uh, and I think that there is some validity to the fact that it's because we don't know the Bible well enough. Which won't be you because you're studying the Word of God with me along together. We're doing this together, which is why we shall be stronger. Amen? So tell me what you observe out of this particular piece of Scripture. I'd love to know. Put down in the comments below. Um, share with somebody what you got out of this. Tell somebody today what you got out of this. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Never forget that. The tempter might keep tempting, but God's greater in you. And he will give you a way to escape every single time. Every single time. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for the promises of your word. Help us to stand on them. I pray, Lord, that we be reminded that there is no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. None. So, Lord, we... We pray, Lord, that we would use the conviction of the Holy Spirit to point us in the right direction and we reject the condemnation that comes from the devil. In Jesus' name, amen.